All right, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host, as I bring you yet another vehicle review here, be it sleet, rain, snow, blizzard, whatever. I'm out here, folks, doing reviews for you. It's a beautiful wintry day today. I've got a Mazda MX-30 2022 model, brand new for Canada and for some of the states, starting in California. I want to thank Mazda Canada for letting me the use of this vehicle for a couple of days. Let me get right into the review. Now, the MX-30 is an interesting vehicle. Um, you know, and Mazda sent me a ton of materials to kind of talk about the vehicle and their thought process and their inspiration and everything. This is Mazda's first foray into the all-electric landscape. The MX-30, I believe, has come out in Europe for several months now. It's now hitting the North American shores. And, you know, it, it uh, encompasses Mazda's key values of a distinctive design, uh, sustainable and well-crafted interior, an engaging driving experience and peace of mind. And, you know, it's a lot of marketing stuff, but what they're really boiling this vehicle down to is, is they're keeping with the Mazda design language, which it is a very nice looking car. I do like the, the design of it. Um, you know, you can talk about sustainability in the interiors and the materials. A lot of manufacturers are doing that. So it's good to see Mazda doing that, but that wouldn't be my main decision for buying a vehicle personally. Some people will. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about a lot of these points, but let me first start again with the design element. It is a very nice design that Mazda's had. Um, it, it is, uh, I guess, a compact SUV or CUV. It's kind of hard to class this. It's not a very big vehicle, as you will see with the interior shots with these freestyle doors that really kind of throw you for a loop. They, they're, they either love them or you hate them. There's no middle ground on this with a back seat that is very, very small. This is, for all intents and purposes, folks, a two plus two vehicle. And I believe Mazda is designing it that particular way um, for, you know, a secondary vehicle for, you know, uh, a single person or a couple or somebody maybe with a small kid or a pet that doesn't need a lot of, of, of rear seat room. Now, if you do in a pinch need to haul a couple of people around, you can do it. So on the design side, again, nice looking vehicle, got all the creature comforts. Um, and, you know, my hat's off to Mazda for, for bringing a very nice design with two-tone availability. This is the GT model. So this is the top of the line model with all the bells and whistles. Now, if we get into some of the more specifics about the vehicle, when we talk about batteries, this is a, a full electric vehicle, a battery electric vehicle, as I mentioned, from Mazda's first four-way into it, into that. It's a lithium ion with prismatic cells. Now, this is a 35.5 kilowatt hour battery pack. And in today's standards, that is quite small. Um, you know, five years ago, that would have been probably the norm. But where we are today at 55, 75, 90 kilowatt and up our packs, um, that, you know, this is pretty low, but Mazda has intentionally brought this vehicle with that size of battery pack uh, in mind to the marketplaces. Um, it, it is water cooled, so it is thermally managed. And I have to admit in my few days of winter driving here with temperatures ranging from, you know, minus six degrees, what it is today, Celsius to, we had a wind chill of minus 10 yesterday to plus 10 the other day, all those different various uh, ranges of Celsius degrees. Uh, the, ba the batteries actually handle quite well in its uh, range estimates and to what it's delivering and its loss of energy because of the cold. It's now winter time and it's not uncommon to see, you know, 25, 30, 40% range loss by any vehicle that's out there strictly with, uh, because of the physics of the batteries and the cold. Now it is powered by a single motor. It's a front wheel drive vehicle. It's got 107 kilowatts of power, which produces 143 horsepower off the line. And max torque is 270 Newton meters or 200 pound feet. So the numbers aren't bad. Now in driving this though, um, one thing that Mazda has done, and I'll talk about it now, I guess, is they've done this software management of the acceleration uh, and driving experience. What I mean by that is you don't get the abrupt acceleration when you floor this uh, accelerator that you do with all other EVs. It's a gradual smooth increase to that uh, full horsepower and full torque uh, numbers that I gave you. 
but they call it jerkiness. They're trying to take the jerk away from the driving experience. You know, this uh, forward and backwards movement when you're driving. Take away the abruptness of the starts and stops as much as possible because there's so much power in these all electric vehicles. So Mazda, I have to admit, my hat's off. I take it off, but it's cold, so I'm gonna leave it on, folks. But they've done a good job at engineering that uh, drivability to take that element out of the equation. It's enough power to pull out and pass. It's enough power to get you on the highway on ramp to get up to speed quickly. It's more than adequate. I think zero to 60 times or somewhere in the eight to eight and a half second range. Certainly nothing, you know, to, to write home about, but enough to work in everyday use. And again, this is designed as an urban commuter primarily. You're not going to do a ton of long distance driving in this because of the range, which I'll get into. In fact, let me talk about that now. So the range on this EPA range is stated at 170 kilometers and uh, 169 or something like that. And that's what I got, about 100 miles, so 160 kilometers. So with that kind of range and with up to 50 kilowatt of, of DC fast charging, uh, it, you're not going to do long road trips. You can, but it's going to take you an awfully long time to do it. And Mazda is not marketing this for that kind of audience. They're marketing this as a secondary vehicle, an urban commuter, you know, and I have to admit, in my couple of days of using this, three days now, doing what I normally do, the range has been fine. I've had no issues in running in, in worrying about running out of battery range for my normal daily tasks. Now, would I drive this to Montreal or Ottawa or Windsor, uh, which I, I do as part of my work? No, that would be too inconvenient to do. But around town and around doing my normal chores, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 kilometers a day. This has no problem at achieving that, even in the cold temperatures that we're having now. It's still holding its charge pretty good. Uh, and But the key here is your um, overnight charging. It runs a 6.6 .6 kilowatt system for level two, and it'll fully charge in about under three hours, which means you can really take advantage of off-peak rates. You can start this at two in the morning and finish at five or six, whatever, and it'll be fully charged and take advantage of that. Or if you're out and about, let's say you're, you're going to a mall, you're gonna go shopping, or you, you have level two availability where your destination is, maybe at a hotel, maybe at a workplace, maybe at a, a, a you know office building or something you can plug this in and get a full charge in under three hours again so you can go shopping spend an hour or two at the mall and pretty well come out with a full charge to get you another 150 kilometers let's say 100 uh, 120. so when you start thinking about the daily use case and how you can maximize this it actually doesn't seem so bad so people you know when, when I told people I was going to review this, people saying, ah, oh, it's not an EV, it's Mazda's compliance vehicle. And yes, there is a compliance layer to this. There's no doubt this vehicle is available in California first. However, in saying that, I get where Mazda's coming from in this uh, you know, commuter vehicle because that's the majority of use cases, especially for secondary households that have, you know, there's some stats that they've sent me about, I think about 86% of Canadians that have a house have at least two cars or more. Um, and they, so they have a house, they have the ability to level two charge or even AC charge anyway, 110, which would take you 13 and a half hours, just over 13 and a half hours from a 110 outlet. So again, you could squeeze that in overnight, technically. You plug it in at seven at night, you're up, you're out at uh, seven in the morning, you're almost at a full charge and nobody takes it down to zero. So, you know, this can't even work for that kind of element. Um, but that's the way that they've marketed this vehicle towards those. And there's millions and millions of Canadians and uh, Americans as well that have a house or have some sort of property that they can connect, that they can plug a vehicle to, to charge overnight. But this does work and that's where Mazda's marketing them. Now they're not gonna build hundreds of thousands of these. I'll be surprised if they, I don't have a number. I know in California, they're selling about 600. They're producing for there. So I'd be surprised if we see a couple of thousand here in Canada, I don't know. I'm just taking a guess, you know, BC and Quebec will be the first provinces, Ontario's following and others. Uh, this, this car has Quebec plates because that's where it's gonna end up selling or be a demo vehicle for. Uh, so I get the use case and, you know, it does make sense. And, and hear me out as I continue on with this review. 
Now from a cargo capacity, it's not huge in this vehicle. Um, behind the second row seats, you have 405 liters of cargo space. And when you put the second row down, uh, it doubles it uh, to more, uh, more than doubles it to a, just over 1,028 liters of space. So it's okay. It's got a decent opening. This part of the shelf uh, comes out quite easily. Doesn't really have much storage under here. It's just for a tire repair kit. There's a safety kit and some tools and things like that. There's no deep storage here. So what you see is what you get here. All right, so as you can see by this design, it doesn't have a big back seat, right? You've got really tiny windows here. These are these freestyle doors. So, you know, the driver and passenger doors are quite wide, easy access into the vehicle. Um, and uh, it's nicely, again, finished and all that stuff. You can see the B-roll that I'll show in the interior to show you the, the um, you know, the finish. It is quite nice and very comfortable. And then there's a latch here to open this uh, secondary door for the rear seat. All right, so now you can see a little bit better. So this door opens uh, and there is, you know, this makes it a big entry. There's no B pillar here because the doors are freestyle to get in. Now to entry to the passenger side, it's not so bad if you need the back seat. There is a hook here or a loop. You pull this loop and of course you can slide the front seat as much as you can and let me do of course my test of getting in and sitting in the vehicles like I always do with my larger frame than normal than healthy people maybe I don't know all right so I'm in now so with the seat forward obviously it was easy enough to get in I'm concerned a little bit about this hump here uh, bonking my head but I haven't done it yet in a couple of times so you know there's definitely room in here but if you're gonna move this seat back a little further, and let me do that here, then, you know, it starts to get a little dicey for leg room. Somebody tall up front, it's gonna be real tight from a leg room. And I'm about five, six, five, seven folks, so I'm not super tall, uh, but that's the way it's going to be. There's, a, there's certainly enough head room. There's, a, there's a, a, a height here in the rear, so I've got more than a fist of head room here, so it's adequate head room. And it's comfortable, it is, cramped because it's a narrower configuration but it does work again in a pinch this will work if you're constantly um, lugging larger people around for the back seat uh, that would be a challenge it's going to be quite uncomfortable over a long time you know if you need to do it once in a while uh, you know, I could see it for kid, uh, kids or a dog okay you could get away with that for for uh, some extended purposes. So it does work, but certainly, you know, don't think that this vehicle uh, is going to offer great comfort for anybody in the rear.
right, so I've talked about a lot of features of this vehicle. Let me tell you, take it for a drive and then give you a little bit more about my thoughts on how this thing drives and how it handles as Mazda's first all electric vehicle. All right, so let me just give you my driving impressions on this Mazda MX-30. Um, as I've been mentioning, you know, one of des uh, Mazda's um, design elements is, is the engineering. One of the key values they talk about is that driving engagement. Um, and you can, I'm not sure how to take that. You know, this isn't a racing car. Even though I did manage to take this a little bit on the track at the Canadian Tire Motorsport Speedway when I was um, out there for Tech Fest uh, in uh, late October, managed to take this for a couple of quick laps on a small track and actually did quite well. You know, it's got big, big tires. Um, uh, the suspension is quite nice. It's stiff yet comfortable if that makes sense it goes over bumps quite easily it doesn't really rock you about so it's well tuned the steering is good one thing about this is that it is brake by um, wire which is interesting because it doesn't feel like it and they've engineered the braking system to give you that experience like you're you know you're actually test you know uh, stepping on the hydraulic brake and uh, even though it's it's electronic that's uh, uh, utilizing the brake so it actually works quite well it gives you that feel um, the steering is good it's electric steering as, as well um, so you know there's nothing to complain about from from a drivability of this vehicle you know it's comfortable inside um, as I had mentioned the it's well appointed um, from a from a technology um, and, and, and convenience um, that perspective um, uh, otherwise you know the sound system is really nice uh, again the drivability on this is quite quite nice it's a very pleasant experience again for the front passengers if you got to sit in the rear for some amount of time that can get quite uncomfortable it's front wheel drive so you know it's got uh, more than enough handling um, again I'll, I'll give it some power I'm just gonna watch it a little bit on these roads um, no problem it's got traction control which will kick in if uh, it detects any wheel slippage now, one of the other things that Mazda has done is they've engineered a sound. So it's not a motor sound, not trying to make this vehicle sound like an internal combustion vehicle. However, you don't really hear the whine of the electric motors that much. You have to kind of really punch it to get that whine coming through. So what they've done is they've pumped, they pumped this artificial sound into the cabin. It's like a very low kind of rumbling if I if that makes sense just kind of an, a low noise that's there might be hard to pick up on the video here with this mic especially since I have winter tires on which are noisier than normal um, and with the snow and the road conditions but you know it just gives you that kind of constant kind of rumble a very very low uh, band noise and it, just to give you a sense that you you know you're not you may be an electric vehicle you may not be I mean just to give you a sense of some sort of feedback that's their take on this and I get that, I understand it, and it does work well. I, again, I think what Mazda has done in this vehicle is designed it so that people that, that know nothing about all electric vehicles and that are looking as a secondary vehicle uh, just to go back and forth to work and run errands and that kind of stuff, just to get in and go. Plug it in, push the start button, put it in gear and go. And don't worry about anything to deal with the, the battery only, you know, the range, the, the um, average, um, you know, efficiency, any of that stuff. I mean, obviously you got to look at the range, but knowing the driving patterns that you'll have will dictate, you know, the, the comfort level that you'll have in this vehicle and gain design for, like just for me to go back and forth to work, as I mentioned every day, this would be ideal. It'd be no problem at all. So interior wise, it's well appointed, very comfortable. Driving wise, it's a, it's a very easy to drive vehicle. It's nimble. Um, it's not that bad to park. You do sit higher. I do like that. Um, this sits just as high as the Leaf, probably maybe even a tad higher. I believe it's the same, similar size vehicle to the uh, Mazda CX um, uh, uh, SUVs, compact SUVs that are out there, their line. So you do get a nice height position. You do get good visibility. Again, other than you know the rear quarter. So those B and C pillars are quite thick. The window is very small. The visibility is challenging, even in a shoulder check environment here. Now, however, uh, Mazda has provided the blind spot mo monitoring, and one element that you can adjust on that feature is the the, detect the detection range. You could set it to you know close, medium, or far kind of element, and I've set it for far. What that means is that when there's a vehicle coming up on the lane beside me, be it right or left, 
and even if they're not in my blind spot, that blind spot warning is going to go off and you get a visual here and then you also get the HUD and I've shown you the HUD a little bit. Um, there is a HUD here. I haven't figured out how to turn the HUD off, so there probably is a way to turn it off, but I haven't seen that in the menuing system. And the HUD gives you a, 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 a visual indication as well if somebody's in your right or left blind spot. So you get the yellow lights, warning lights on the mirrors and you get that HUD indication so I like that I think that they've realized you know that the design of this vehicle has those thick pillars so they better put some more warning systems and then it warns on the dash if you're trying to change lanes and somebody's coming up in that spot it gives you a visual and an audible warning and you can play with those settings so I thought that that feature was quite good I haven't seen that on any other vehicles as far as being able to adjust the range of the blind spot warning usually they're they, they go off when they're in your blind spot or extremely close to it but you can set this one earlier if you want which is what I've done I think to maximize safety because it is a bit challenging to check blind spots here it's not impossible but it's challenging um, so any additional features you have for that would help so overall you know it's, it's a thumbs up from a driving experience perspective it's very nice it's comfortable it's very quiet you know it's maybe hard to tell with these snow tires but it's pretty quiet but this, uh, this is very comfortable and very nice, easy to turn, easy to maneuver. Uh, when I uh, came back from Toronto, you know, moving around city traffic. So again, that's how they designed this. This is not a race car, nor, sh nor should it be thought of that way. It has nice smooth acceleration. So um, I can't really floor it here because the traction control is gonna kick in. But you know, if I give it, uh, yeah, say the wheels spin there. So, but as you can see, I'm not, my neck isn't snapping back into the seat. Um, even when I get some grip here, it's a smooth, steady acceleration. And that's, that's that jerkiness I talked about that they've taken out of, of the equation. So they've put a lot of thought into this. Um, so I do like it. it is a, it's a nice quality vehicle and an experience on the inside um, and very easy to drive. And um, I don't know what else to say, but it is nice, nice experience in here. Also, also want to just quickly mention about the paddle shifters and the regen. As I mentioned, they've made it adjustable um, and you can, you can set the amount of regen, either positive or if you want to coast longer. Um, it does use a combination of regenerative and friction braking for the regen functions. I find it living at the one down arrow seems to be a good mix, but now this doesn't really have one pedal driving. It won't take you to a full stop. It does have an auto hold button, which means when you, when you come to a stop on your, on your own with the brakes, uh, after a couple of seconds, then the auto hold light will come on and then it'll hold the vehicle. You can take your foot off the brake, but you have to manually stop the vehicle and hold it for a second or two before it activates. It's very finicky there. I couldn't, um, uh, sometimes it didn't, it didn't work. I was a little bit too impatient. So then I figured out I had to leave my foot for a little longer on the brake, but it does do that. That's one thing about this vehicle. It's very smooth in both acceleration and deceleration when you drive it normally. So a couple other features I wanted to mention uh, before I forget on this video.
So I hope you enjoyed my driving thoughts on this vehicle and, you know, ov overall kind of thoughts that I provided so far. You know, how to summarize this. I've been struggling, as I mentioned off the top, to really kind of figure out um, the recommendation for this vehicle. And, you know, folks, I'm, everybody knows that I'm always going to give a thumbs up for an all electric vehicle right off the bat. Um, because it eliminates, you know, it's a zero emission vehicle and that's the end goal that we're trying to get to. Now for this vehicle, I understand again where Mazda is going. They're providing a, a nice driving experience, a comfortable driving experience with a well-designed, <clears throat> excuse me, well-built vehicle. Solid thuds, the door closes, nice uh, materials on the inside, well-appointed. You know, uh, it's just, there's a lot of thought I could see that, I've, that has gone into this vehicle. So I get it, it is a nice solid vehicle. Where I struggle with this is on the price point and the range, the features that you get for that price point, even though Mazda is marketing this as a secondary vehicle market. I get it, I understand it. So the price point here in Canada, it's just over 42,000 for the base unit, and then the GT unit that this is, is just over 47,000. So even if you look at the GT, you look at this, you look at you know your taxes, your freight, PDI, all that kind of stuff, Take away this, both models qualify for the $5,000 federal rebate here in Canada. Of course, provincial incentives will stack on that. And then in the U.S., it will qualify for the U.S. tax credit as is right now and any other uh, state or, or local credits that you can get or incentives that you can get. So it should will qualify for that. So it can, the price can come down. But if I'm looking here as a consumer in Ontario, all I've got to play with is the $5,000. So out the door, this model is just is, is over $50,000. Uh, in that low $50,000 range. That's a lot of money for a vehicle that's primarily a two-seater, a two plus two in a pinch, with 170 kilometers of battery range. It's a lot of money compared to what else is on the marketplace in Canada. You know, the Nissan Leaf, 40 kilowatt being the lowest price all electric in Canada at under $40,000 uh, MSRP. You've got uh, the Chevy Bolt, uh, as I've, I've done reviews on the Bolt EUV, which are aggressively priced, even though, you know, GM's still struggling to get the batteries fixed, they are going to be fixed. And then there'll be a lot of happy owners out there that have a very good value a vehicle from an all electric, you know, with double the ranges, even the Leaf has probably about 50% more range than this vehicle. So there's a, there's a lot of vehicles um, that, uh, you know, can fit into this range of that $50,000 out the door price here in Ontario, in Canada, that are available to compete that I would argue are just as good from a drivability now. Maybe the Bolt interior is not as refined and, craft and nice as this, comfortable. Maybe the Leaf might have more plastics in it than this does, than soft touch materials. But you know, for the price difference, as a, especially as a secondary vehicle, I personally, I wouldn't care. It, it's a tough uh, quandary that Mazda has kind of put this vehicle in. But in saying that, I am very glad that they brought an all-electric vehicle out to the marketplace. You know, the more, uh, the more the better. But as I mentioned earlier, I don't see them moving very large quantities of these vehicles anytime soon. Mazda does have a game plan. They have a target. You know, they have a they have a plan for this decade. They call it the Zoom Zoom 2030, I believe, so that they can they can add. They're going to add more all electric vehicles. They are going to focus on plug-in vehicles a lot as well, and hybrid vehicles. Still, they're going to build a lot of those uh, you know different models. But they are going to expand the portfolio. Probably get larger range capacities and all sorts sort of stuff. Now, one of the things I did want to mention before I close off is that um, this vehicle is designed to be able to put <clears throat> uh, what they call a range extender version into this, a small engine. Um, and if you look at these pictures with the hood raised, you'll see that there's a cavernous area within the front uh, uh, hood, uh, within the front engine bay, uh, that is unused. And if people are, some people have said, well, why didn't they put a, a frunk in there, you know, a front trunk? Well, the reason is, is because Mazda has built this platform so it's interchangeable, this particular style, with the full electric and with the plug-in hybrid version that'll be coming out, or the range extender, which they'll put a small engine up front to act as a generator uh, and, and add more mileage, a la the Chevy Volt type of experience. So in conclusion, you know, as, as I said, would I recommend this vehicle? Absolutely, I give it a thumbs up. I would recommend it. But you have to really think about what your use case is and, and try this vehicle out because ergonomically, it's not going to work for everybody. And again, for the price point, there are 
other really good options that are out there. If people are, are loyal Mazda owners and customers, they're going to like this vehicle because it's, they're very familiar with that experience and with the quality and what the engineering and everything that Mazda brings. So you will get value out of this vehicle if it works for you. Um, again, thank you very much Mazda for letting me the use of this vehicle. I appreciate it. And if people have any questions or comments, they can certainly email. And that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show as I try to wrap this up in this cold snow today. Thanks very much for tuning in. I appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube, please do. I'd much appreciate it. And if you want to click that bell, get notified of more episodes. If you're a Patreon supporter, thank you very much. You know who you are. You know, I'm always very humbled by Patreon. I, I sound like a broken record, but it's I really, really mean it, folks. You know, I appreciate any, anybody that's thinking of, of helping me out on Patreon. It's certainly not forgotten each and every episode. And keep watching the EV landscape. All kinds of stuff happening. Next year is going to be a lot more models coming out, even with chip shortages and all this kind of supply chain. We'll still see stuff hit the streets at some point, and I hope to have a whole whack of reviews lined up. So continue to watch that space. Again, everybody stay safe. We're still going through the pandemic stuff, so use your common sense when you're out there. And until the next time, I will see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.